The hymn just sung was, I believe in Jesus. Indeed, we believe in Jesus. We believe that a man called Jesus lived upon the earth. We believe that that individual died. And we believe that he arose from the dead, thereby conquering death and bringing salvation to the whole human family. There is, during the month of December, a concentration upon the name of Jesus. Even people who do not recognize Him at other times of the year think about Him in this particular month. Many celebrate this month as the birth of Jesus Christ. The Bible does not inform us as to when Jesus was born. The day that has been attached to His birth, December 25th, is a matter of human tradition. But many will pause during this time of year to think upon Jesus Christ. Many will pay Him the honor that He so richly deserves. We are thinking in three different lessons about Jesus Christ. In our last lesson, we concentrated upon the birth of Christ. The name that He was given, the purpose for which He was born, and the revelation that He fulfilled in coming to the earth. Today, I want to come to Matthew chapter 22 and consider a question that is posed by Jesus to the multitude that was listening to Him on this particular occasion. The Sadducees have come to Jesus and they have inquired of Him concerning a woman who has had seven husbands and they all have died. Their inquiry is as to which husband this woman will belong in the resurrection. This is an odd question that is posed by the Sadducees because they did not believe in the resurrection. Their only reason thereby for coming to Christ would be to entangle Him in His words. The Sadducees were given an answer by Christ and it confounded them. And after they departed, Jesus then turned to the Sadducee or the Pharisees and there was a question asked of Jesus by one of those Pharisees as to the greatest commandment in the law. It was here that Jesus taught them that one is to love God above and beyond all things. He is to love God with the entirety of His being. And the second commandment was like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then in Matthew chapter 22, we come to verse 41 and verse 42. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ, whose Son is He? They say unto Him, The Son of David. I want to consider this question that Jesus asked, Whose Son is He? There are five people identified in the pages of the New Testament as to whom the Son of Christ was. We know from Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus was the son of Joseph. Joseph was espoused to Mary who became the mother of Christ. They were not married at the time that Jesus was conceived by Mary. And we recall from Matthew chapter 1 that Joseph desired to put her away privily. But while he thought upon those things, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him, telling him that he was to take unto him Mary, thy wife. That child that was conceived within her was not by the natural process of procreation, but rather by the power of the Almighty. The Holy Spirit had conceived that child within Mary. 
And later we find that Joseph took unto Mary his wife, took unto him Mary his wife, and they raised a family. In the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus returns home to the place where he was raised, the city of Nazareth. Verse 16 of Luke 4 says, He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue upon the Sabbath day. Being in the synagogue upon the Sabbath day, Jesus took the book that was delivered unto him and opened that book unto the place of Isaiah the prophet, where he read this scripture from verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Isaiah had predicted that Christ would be born of a virgin, that He would come into the world, and as Jesus read this particular passage, Isaiah identified the mission for which Jesus would come. In verse 21, Jesus says, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus had read from this marvelous passage of Old Testament Scripture and declared unto them that the words which Isaiah had spoken some 700 years earlier had now been fulfilled. It was at this point that the multitude which heard Jesus speak in verse 22 made this statement, Is not this Joseph's son? Nazareth was the despised village from which Jesus had come. Nazareth would be the place where the words of Jesus were rejected. Here he is identified as the son of Joseph. In John chapter 6 and verse 42, Jesus is talking to the multitude about the miracle of the loaves that He has performed and how the multitude had flocked to partake of those loaves. And now after Jesus had performed that miracle, they had returned again. And Jesus said they did not come because of the Word of God, but rather they came because of the loaves with which He had fed them. He then refer, takes their mind back to the time when God fed them with manna in the wilderness, and with that manna they were sustained. It was at this point that Jesus turned their, the attention of their mind to the fact that He was the living bread that had been sent down from heaven. And He makes the statement, I am the bread which has come down from heaven. It was then at verse 42 when that multitude was hearing Jesus speak, they said, Is not this the son of Joseph? His mother and his father we know. How saith he then, I came down from heaven? The multitude saw Jesus as the son of Joseph. They were familiar with the earthly life of Christ. They were aware of the home in which he had grown to manhood. In Matthew 13 and verse 55, the multitude said, Is not this the carpenter's son? Joseph, therefore, was a carpenter. Jesus would follow in the footsteps of his father and spent the early years of his manhood as a carpenter. And so Jesus is identified in Scripture as the son of Joseph. But Jesus was also the son of Mary. In Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, the multitude said, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? 
Here the multitude identifies not only, not only the profession of Christ, that of being a carpenter following in the footsteps of his father Joseph, but also as the son of Mary. We know as we study Matthew chapter 1, the birth of Jesus Christ, that Mary was the young virgin girl who conceived Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, God had spoken to Adam and Eve and the serpent. And He said there, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Birth depends upon the seed of man, not the seed of woman. Procreation depends upon the seed of man, not the seed of woman. But here God identifies the seed that will ultimately bruise the head of Satan as the seed of woman, her seed. The seed would not come from Joseph in the creation of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it would come, as is stated in Matthew chapter 1, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we see from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that God's prediction about her seed bruising the head of Satan would come to be fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 1 and verse 34, after the angel has spoken to Mary about the birth of the Son that she would bring into the world and the uniqueness of that birth, she made this statement unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Mary wondered how she was going to bring forth a son, since she did not know a man. In Luke chapter 2 at verse 7, the record declares, and she brought forth her firstborn son. The young virgin girl Mary went down into the land of motherhood and came forth from that land bearing the Christ in her arms. She brought forth her firstborn son, therefore she had other sons. Those sons are identified in the 13th chapter of Matthew and in other places. And so we know that Mary was not that perpetual virgin that many claim her to be, but rather she was ultimately married to Joseph, and they raised a family where Jesus had brothers and sisters. Jesus was her firstborn son, having fulfilled the ancient prophecy of Almighty God, and now the prediction of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 48, the Scripture says, And when they saw Him, as His parents had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of the Passover, they were amazed, and His mother said unto Him, Son, why hast Thou thus dealt with us? Behold, Thy father and I have sought Thee sorrowing. Jesus has stayed back in Jerusalem. There He conversed with the lawyers and the doctors. And then after a three days, Mary and Joseph discovered that He was not with them. And so they went to find Him. They found Him in the synagogue, conversing with those men who were highly learned in the Old Testament law. And she referred to Him as Son. In Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16, the Scripture says, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is also called Christ. Jesus, therefore, whose son is he? He is the son of Joseph, and he is the son of Mary. And the Scripture also states that he is the son of Abraham. In Matthew 1 and verse 1, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ was the son of Abraham. God had made a promise to Abraham in the long ago, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, that through his seed he would bless all the nations of the earth. 
when the Apostle Peter speaks in Acts chapter 3 at verse 25, he says, Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. That ancient promise that was so familiar to the minds of the Israelite nation. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, God through Abraham's seed would bless all the nations of the earth. Peter now states is being fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen the earthly nature of the Lord Jesus Christ and now we see the providential nature of Jesus. How God was going to bring one into the world through whom all the nations of humanity would be blessed. The Apostle Peter states that that promise is now fulfilled in the person of Christ. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Roman church in Romans chapter 9 and verse 4, he declares unto them that he speaks the truth in Christ. He is going to take a look at their history and remind them who they are and what their relationship to God truly is in the person of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 4 of Romans 9, Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. God reminds them, or uh, Paul reminds them of all that God has done for them, of all the provision that God has made with them. And then in verse 5 he said, Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Jesus Christ had come through the seed of Abraham, therefore the son of Abraham, bringing to fulfillment the ancient prophecy that God had made concerning this child that would be born into the world. How significant to humanity was the birth of Jesus Christ. How significant it is that He is identified as the son of Abraham. In Galatians chapter Chapter 3, where the Apostle Paul draws together this great allegory concerning Ishmael and our Galatians 4, rather, where he draws this great allegory concerning Ishmael and Isaac, the son of the flesh and the son of promise. He says in Galatians 4 and verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Isaac was the chosen son through whom the seed would come. Abraham had given birth not only to Ishmael, but also to Isaac. Isaac was that one who was chosen by God through whom that seed would come. He was the son of promise. And Paul declares that because Isaac was born from the seed of Abraham, so now we are the children of promise. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, the apostle Paul said, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. But Jesus is also the son of David. Back to Matthew 1 and verse 1. The generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. As Jesus was the son of David, it pointed to the kingly nature of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of promises and prophecies that God had made. We see that as Jesus is identified as the son of these various individuals, it is the fulfillment of God's providential concern for the redemption and salvation of humanity. In Matthew 22 at verses 42 through 45, Jesus had said to this multitude, 
as he said, What think ye of Christ, whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. They understood that Jesus was the son of David, the Christ. He said unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? David had predicted the very statement that Jesus had made in the book of Psalms at chapter 110, verse 1. All of the Old Testament pointed to the coming of Christ. The writings of Moses, the writings of David, the writings of all of the prophets were predictions that Christ would be born and come as the fulfillment of God's means of saving the human family. In verse 46, the record says, No man was able to answer him a word, neither dost any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Jesus presented to them a statement of fact which they could not understand, which they could not explain. When we come to Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, the angel Gabriel had appeared unto Mary concerning the conception of the one who would be called Jesus. In verse 32 and 33 of Luke 1, the angel said, He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign forever over the house of Jacob, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. This is how Jesus was the son of David. God had predicted unto David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 17 or 14 that he would establish his kingdom forever. He would establish his throne forever. He would establish his house forever. The house, throne, and kingdom of David would be established forever. And now Mary is told by the angel Gabriel that Jesus is the fulfillment of that ancient promise. He would sit upon the throne of his father David. When Pilate consented to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and he was sent to the cross in Matthew 27 and verse 37, Pilate had an inscription placed above the cross which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In the conversation that Jesus had had with Pilate in John chapter 18 and verse 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is not a worldly, earthly, temporal kingdom as all kingdoms of the earth are. But the kingdom of Jesus Christ would be an eternal kingdom. And through Christ as the son of David, the house, kingdom, and throne of David would be established forever. Whose son is he? He is the Son of God. In Matthew or Mark 1 and verse 1, Mark says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus was the son of Joseph. He was the son of Mary, the earthly existence of Jesus. He was the son of Abraham, the providential promise that God had made that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He was the son of David, the kingly nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as the son of God, the Bible points to the eternal divine nature of Jesus Christ. He was God in the flesh. God had visited the footstool of man in the person of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 14 and verse 33, after Jesus had stilled the waters whereupon Peter himself had walked, 
that multitude of disciples said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. John declares in chapter 1 and verse 14 of his gospel, the Word whom in verse 1 he says was with God and was God became flesh and dwelt among us. The glory of the only begotten from the Father full of grace and truth. Later in John chapter 3 and verse 16, John would write that beloved passage of Scripture which has been memorized by the minds of so many over time. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but should have everlasting life. And then in verse 18, Jesus said to Nicodemus, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, because he hath not believed on the only begotten from the Father. Three times in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 verse 14, chapter 3 verse 16, chapter 3 verse 18, Jesus uses the term begotten of God. The term begotten means that Jesus possessed all of the qualities of God. He possessed all of the nature of God. He had been born of God, brought into the world by God. The conception of Mary, this young virgin, was by the power of the highest. The Holy Spirit had conceived that divine child within her. And so in Galatians 4 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul would say that God had sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. Jesus Christ is God's Son. We have His Spirit, the Spirit of God's Son, living within us to identify us as children of God, thereby giving assurance that we have been adopted into the family of God. In Colossians 1 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul said, For it pleased God that in Him, Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. The complete, total fullness of Almighty God dwelt within the Lord Jesus Christ. He was man, but He was God. Jesus questioned to the multitude in Matthew 22, verse 42 is, Whose son is he? The Bible identifies that Jesus is the son of Joseph. Jesus is the son of Mary. Jesus is the son of Abraham. Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the son of God. And all of those identities... The answer to that ancient question asked by the Lord Jesus Christ points to God's purpose in bringing Christ into the world for the salvation and redemption of all of humanity. Let us honor Him as the Son of the Heavenly Father. Jesus wants all men everywhere to come to Him, to believe on Him, to honor Him. Not at one particular time of the year, but at all times of the year. Jesus wants the total life to be surrendered unto Him so that eternal life might be ours. We offer the invitation of Jesus Christ through repentance, confession, faith, and immersion in water whereby we might know Him not only as the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, the son of Abraham, the son of David, but as indeed the Son of God. We offer that invitation as we stand and sing.